Uh, can you see, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, and can you see me? No. Because, you know, I, as you know that, I, I suffered a stroke about a year ago and I still have troubles getting up. Okay, so how long? Two years. Two years, okay. Uh, so I will remain seated as much as possible. And uh, I have to also to warn you about Papi. I don't hit like Papi of the Red Sox, <laughs> okay? I never was a good hitter. I was, however, a cunning and so on player. Uh, and, and I had pretenses uh, of play professional baseball. So I went to see my coach in the University of Havana and I said, coach, if I have a, a regime a regime of exercises and so on, you think I could do it? And he said, yeah, you, it, it will do you good. Uh, you will increase your batting average from 220 to 240. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I decided to forget that. And then I, I became a good student to the delight of my father. Okay. Well, I put this book together. I have this question uh, as simple to, to the reader, to the fan, uh, no pretenses of theory of music and so on. You read every chapter and you will understand everything even if you don't like opera. Now, if you develop a taste for opera, here is a, a, an old colleague uh, from Plymouth State uh, that came to see me with his wife to take my course called Are You Afraid of Opera? that I taught for 30 years, you know, and he said, would I would I be able to, uh, to really to do well in the course? I said, there is no question of that. However, I warn you, it's addictive. <laughs> Once you take it and like it, your life won't be the same ever. And you can ask Gloria, we have, we have traveled in the Western world uh, chasing an opera to see it and so on. So, and uh, the late uh, uh, professor in the science department, Bill Nykam and his wife, uh, we went all over the place and people thought that we were crazy, okay? <laughs> and we were. <laughs> now, now I, 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 this book, why is called Cleo's Song? People don't realize that the, uh, in, in the old mythological world, uh, they, 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 the gods, the other uh, mythological people uh, decided to name Cleo because uh, history had no, no one to, you know, infuse uh, and so on. So they said, you are going to be the muse of historians. There is a very interesting movie comic uh, about uh, the, uh, the, uh, a writer who needs the muse, and the muse is very whimsical and so on, and believe me, it is. And uh, why songs? Because uh, Cleo knew how to play instruments. And uh, why that? Because he had to entertain many times Zeus, the, the, the god of the, of the Greek mytho mythology. So that is why it's called Cleo's Song. No, don't, don't feel bad if you didn't do that or know that, because us historians, uh, many historians, many colleagues don't know who is our muse. Okay, and it is Cleo right there. Very good. Uh, what happened to me once is that I was having trouble with my students coming to class. Imagine it was a class at eight o'clock in the morning for freshmen. Okay, <laughs> they had come and you know they don't go to bed very, very late. Okay. 
And I said, I was frustrated. So I uh, availed myself of a big record or CD player, uh, good speakers, and I went there. And why is, was there the figure of Akhenaten, the Egyptian pharaoh? Because Akhenaten, uh, you know, made us in, in the world trans transit for the for um, uh, <laughs> uh, mythology to science from uh, a, a world that was, you know, w w worshiping a hippopotamus or, or a giraffe to s worship the sun, what he called the only God. The transfer from that to the Hebrew concept, because that was a material concept, uh, came 140 years later that they moved to make God a spiritual figure in, in, in history. So that's why Akhenaten is there, not because we are going to sing Aida, okay? <laughs> well, there is a no, you ask me, why are you a fan of opera? I really don't know. I know that once uh, in my hometown, Havana, there was a, a, uh, a, a company that came to play several operas, and one of them was Aida. Uh, and I was at that time studying at, in the school a unit on the Egyptians. So I said to my dad, I want to see that. No. You're going to fall asleep in the second act. You, there were no, no CCs in those days. So, and I am not going to explain to you every, every moment of the opera. No, 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 I want to go. I want to go. So they took me. Okay. Guess what? Three and a half hours later, f four acts later, when the curtain came down, I turned to my dad and I said, that's it? <laughs> I, I, I didn't miss anything of, of the opera that was 70 some years ago and I have never lost my taste for Aida. I love to go uh, and, and watch it and so on. So, but uh, there is something called the uh, French Grand opera, grand historical opera, and I am a, a historian. So the two things came together, the opera and history. And history is the greatest drama that exists in the world. And, and, and we could uh, approach it from different sides. And then I, uh, that's why I came to the opera, and that's why I came to, uh, to history. Now, I intend tonight not give you a lecture on the history of the opera and so on and so on. No, 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 no relax. I, <laughs> <laughs> I intend to uh, uh, do some aspects of French grand historical opera. Uh, La Boheme, one of the most beautiful operas ever composed, is not French grand opera. La Boheme is a very intimate opera, and, uh, and it, it has the death of a seamstress. She dies of, a, of consumption at the end. French grand historical opera demands big uh, stages, uh, masses in the, on the stage, and grand, bigger than life, grand characters there. And that's what I intend to do with you, and also at the same time, fiction. Tom, can you give us the next slide? Okay. Uh, the greatest uh, composer of French grand operas is Giacomo Meyerbeer. He actually, uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, move opera from the royal palaces, and, uh, you know, those minuets and so on, because the French Revolution 
uh, swept uh, the aristocracy and they wanted, uh, the people wanted action on the stage and they want to see revolutions, they want to see all of these things that they had witnessed of that they have suffered. So he realized that and said, oh, is that what they want? That's what I will give to them. And he was a king of the opera up to the 1840s, more or less. And he's known as the father of grand opera. Some people say no, but I say yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the next slide. One of the operas that he wrote in 1836 is Les Huguenots. I wonder if you know who the Les Huguenots were. Les Huguenots, Les Huguenots were the French Protestant. And remember, the wars between the Catholics and the Huguenots almost destroyed France. So here, he had a theme that would be very interesting, and he would give them masses on the stage, and he would give exciting singers. Um, so I brought here for us to see and, uh, and hear a very interesting moment in the opera, the Huguenot. The Catholics are planning the massacre, the famous massacre of 1552, and kill all the Huguenots, they say so, kill all the Huguenots. And uh, they invited them to uh, Paris and so on to make peace and, and so on. And then on that night, 24 of August, they plan to fall on these uh, Huguenots, that's the official theory, and exterminate them. Now, if, if don't give me a, a the, the Huguenot moment in which they are preparing to do that.
Okay. Yeah. Very well. By the this is 1836. By the year 1900, Les Huguenots had been performed a thousand times in France, in Paris alone, and it went around the world. Now I will I would like to make a couple of of. Uh, I I love this this. Uh, Scene. I have a complete recording, and I, you know, sit down to uh, watch it in my my machine, and I never get beyond that. I go back and I go back <laughs> and I go back without pangs of conscience, because remember, when we use a needle on a record back many years that you may not remember, that needle was a glorified nail. You just put it on the record and it ate the record away. So your conscience was bothering you. But here, no bother, you know, let's go back and let's go back. Another very interesting commentary right there. It's the, uh, the uh, uh, you heard, perhaps remember the going the call, call and to a climax. It's been explained by the expert, I am not an expert, that that is the flow of history. This is happening since year one. People murdering other people because they are different religions uh, or different race and so on. So uh, you know what that meant for Meyer Beer. Meyer Beer was a Jew and he was in France putting this, <laughs> this opera on the stage. And the people said, uh, how dare you? I said, this is a historical episode. I, I have nothing to do. Uh, but I have treated the, the Huguenot very con great, uh, <laughs> and that is a delightful part in the Huguenot when Raoul, one of the characters uh, who is a Huguenot, is invited by the French nobility to attend the banquet. And then he comes to the place and he's look around and he said, this is fantastic. Oh, what an opulence. Um, I, whenever I see that, I remember, oh, if my friends could see me now. <laughs> okay, uh, let's look at another aspect of French Grand Opera. It's a creation of a character. Uh, sung by tenors, and these tenors have to be heroic because it's, it's high, it's powerful, and they have to use all the strength that you can. Tom, you could give me the next slide. Uh, forget about that, okay? <laughs> that was for my students. That opera is called La Juive. No, stop it. La Juive. Jewish, which in French means a Jewish, the Jew or the Jew girl. And it has a common plot. This fellow right here found an abandoned little girl. There was riots in France and so on, and he picked her up and waited to see the parents recall it. They didn't. They perhaps were killed. In, in the riots, so he took her home and he raised her, okay? Uh, he never told her the story. So she grew thinking, I am a Jew, oh, okay? Well, here at the, at the uh, more or less at the end of the opera, uh, the, the cardinal of, uh, of France, who had been a soldier, and now, you know, went into the church, became a cardinal, and he heard rumors that his daughter, his daughter is alive. You know, this soldier turned into cardinal, and he's looking for her all over the place. And then, finally, uh, he hears that this fellow that you have here had his daughter, but he wasn't sure of that. So. Uh, the, the, the story develops 
that he is found guilty. You know, in those days, the two faiths could not marry under the death of penalty. And, uh, and they f f uh, find, uh, he goes to see his daughter, Rachel, and he said, Rachel, uh, I want you to know this. I've been found guilty. They are going to kill me. Uh, but, but you could avoid that, and you could go to a family that is rich and will have a, a delightful life. Rachel answered, no, you're my father. And wherever you go, I will follow you. Okay, this is a moment uh, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the I think he was a rabbi has to uh, answer to the cardinal and so on uh, and observe the scene. Uh, you know, it's full of of electricity. The cross is being persecuted and and the rabbi, and he is going to sing now. Uh, don't try to sing this unless you are a Helden tenor. A Helden tenor has lungs like this, <laughs> and uh, there are very few uh, in, in existence. But here we have Neil Chikov, the singer, uh, an American, decided to sing it in Austria, because the Austrians had never come to terms until that moment with the uh, Holocaust and so on. And La, La Juive is the name of the opera, had not been staged in, in Austria for 40 years or so. Well, the company decided to do that, and they brought the production to home, to the Metropolitan Opera, and I said to Gloria, listen, we have to go to New York. You know, we have to see that opera. I don't want to die without seeing it, blah, 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 blah. It was in records, it was so, but not in the flesh. Okay, this is that performance in New York. So if Tom hits the button, we're going to see. Fasten your seat belt. <laughs> Thank you. It's too, it's too high there. Okay.
taken it. I wonder if you observe his expression. Okay. I wonder if you observe his expression in the middle of the aria. He is not in this world. He is somewhere else, you know. And when he finishes, he remains with closed eyes, and then slowly he returns to the world with us. And you could see that in his expression. But all the time he was there somewhere. And I, I, with the opera La Juive happens the same thing. I hear that and I will go back with the controls and I go back with the controls to listen to it. Okay, uh, I remember when I <clears throat> it was interviewed by uh, the, the document maker, what was his name? Ken Burns. Ken Burns, and I was being interviewed to see if they would put me in the program. And casually I said, well, you know, I like opera much, very much. And the, the, the lady that was interviewing me said, how is that possible that you like baseball so much and you just like the opera? And I answered, because they are the same thing. They are exactly the same thing. You go to baseball and you wait for seven innings. <laughs> nothing has happened. And then somebody hits a home run and you go back home and say, what, that wasn't that a great game? <laughs> and in opera, sometimes you go to hear one aria. People go to hear this. And then if it's well performed, they go home happily uh, and so on. Oh, that opera is tremendously. Well, this wasn't a Meyerbeer opera. This was uh, uh, Halleby, uh, another composer of big uh, operas, who wrote it. And there was a rivalry between Meyerbeer and Halleby. Uh, Halleby wrote beautiful operas, but Meyerbeer was most famous. I think that after this experience, I would like to hear your reactions. They wanted to know when was that production? Uh, that production came to New York. It was when? Two uh, about 10 years ago. Yes. But uh, I want to say this, and I am going to be fried. I think, keep, keep the secret, uh, the secret, I think there is a prejudice in the Met, because they don't do these operas, especially if they are, were written by uh, Jewish. And Halabi was Jewish, uh, Meyerbeer was Jewish, and, uh, and uh, they wrote this opera. Uh, Caruso used to sing this. Uh, I remember my father's records. You remember those, uh, you're too young. Those records that were hard like a stone from the Stone Age. You remember if they hit you with one of them, you had it. And then the, the pickup arm had a, 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 a screw here that you put a, 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 a glorified nail there and then put it in the record. You, you thought you were in the showers. Uh, but uh, those operas train us, we learn them, we love them. And now the, the productions are beautiful, the sound is tremendous. Uh, and then you can appreciate uh, Halevi operas have a treasure of melodies, beautiful melodies and so on. But the Met refuses uh, to, uh, to uh, stage them. 
and uh, Gloria and I, uh, you know, went to New York because they brought the production from Vienna and it had not performed in the United States for 40 years. A little tidbit on this opera, it was done in 2003, and just so you know, I was in this production. He was not feeling well that day. No, there was a great tenor. He was not well that day. He was, shook up. He was not feeling well. So <laughs> there, there, there was a great tenor, American tenor, Richard Tucker, and he was Jewish. And he constantly said to the direction of the people in charge in the Metropolitan, put love you if I can sing that like nobody. And they never did, and he died, and so uh, we lost. Okay, I think that, yes? Yes, this is the one that came from Vienna. They met put it because there was a, a people asking for it, asking for it. Uh, and finally they said, we have to do this. You know, they, so they, they put it and they recorded, thank God, it's in video. Okay, there, there you are. And Chikov, you know, the tenor, was asking also for it, which he, he's Jewish. Uh, put it there, you know, there, there is public for these things and so on. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, any other questions you may have at this stage? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's the second part. Uh, when do you finish the performances here? No, no. <laughs> At 8 o'clock, no, wait a minute. We are going to break, but I don't want you to go because I have a surprise right there. And I want to expose you to that surprise. What's that? We don't need a long break. No. Oh, you don't need it? No. Very well. Okay. I am going to play uh, an, an aria. Take no. a break, do you? No, I, I, keep, you know, keep going. You know, I would go back home and collapse on the bed and so on. But I want you to expose. I don't know if you are aware there is an opera very successful by an American composer, and that is uh, what was the name? Uh, Moby. Moby Dick. Okay, Moby Dick, would you expect to see an opera here, an opera like Moby Dick? My God, some people don't even understand what he, uh, Moby Dick is. Something. <laughs> so, Tom, give me the uh, Moby Dick. Do you want to skip the cinema one, or do you want them to see No, no, I would skip that. The people, they, they had enough already. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay very good. This is a movie. Let me look into a human eye. It is better than to gaze into sea or sky. So now for the last time I ask thee, I implore thee, let us fly these deadly waters, let us home. Have they not such mild blue days even as this in old new bedroom? He is a Starbuck. He came to kill Ahab. Inscrutable, unearthly thing. Command me against all human lovings and longings. To keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time. Making me do what in my own natural heart I dare not dream of doing. Is Ahab, Ahab, is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun cannot move except by God's invisible power, how can my small heart beat, my brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not? Turn round and round in this world. Like 
Yonder windless, and fate is the hand smiling. And all the time, that smiling sky and this unsounded sea. Look ye into its deeps and see the everlasting slaughter that goes on. Who put it into its creatures to chase and fang one another? Where do murderers go, man? Who's the doom when the judge himself is dragged before the bar? But it is a mild, mild day. Okay, Tom. Now we're going to see and hear the aria of that moment of the opera Moby Dick uh, by Jake, Jake uh, Hagee, an American composer. Okay?
okay? Uh, the French got an opera. I wrote this book. It, it has the 11 great French grand opera written in very simple language because I, I, my, that's what I can do with music. I, I'm not writing uh, seven magnify and all of those things. I don't understand that. I, I wrote it for you. I wrote it for my friends. Uh, so uh, it's selling here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it makes good presents to people that you know that the opera. <laughs> And it is, uh, it's Lisa here. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa are Mirani. you still here? I, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, thank you very much. Um, uh, Herb, who we sat, we sat there in, uh, uh, Lisa is right there. Lisa uh, printed this. Lisa, look for this cover and the illustrations. This cover is outstanding. I, I, wait, I look for a cover and I couldn't find anything. And when she's, she uh, showed it to me, I said, Lisa, you, you keep this secret. I think the cover is better than the contents of the book. <laughs> and, and it is, you reach for it because you want to see this. It's a fantastic thing. So I have to... <laughs> I have to thank. Uh, is Herb? no Herb already? He has his <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, Ruth. Uh, Ruthie, uh, you know I write uh, English with Spanish. Where I am a catastrophe writing. Uh, okay, and she sat down and read the whole manuscript, uh, 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 correcting and so on. There is one passage, and I am now going to tell you, that she came and said, I don't know what to do with your English here. <laughs> so uh, what did I do? I cut it out. It's not there, any <laughs> it's not there anymore. So uh, let's break for a little refreshment. Yes.